Hello and welcome to today's CID speaker series. My name is Sarah Luttrell. I'm the Communications and Events Manager at the Center for International Development at Harvard University. I look forward to today's dis discussion on the core ideas of donut economics and how this idea is being put into action in cities all around the world. The format for today's discussion, as usual, is about a 20 to 25 minute presentation, um, leaving around 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we start. So during the Q&A session, uh, we just ask that you submit your questions directly into the chat or by using the raise your hand function. Our CID student ambassador, Shada El-Sharif, is going to moderate today's Q&A session. Uh, so she'll be gathering all of your questions in the chat or uh, inviting you to ask your questions directly to the speaker. Uh, we're also recording today's session, as you might be able to see. Uh, the video of this event will be available on CID's YouTube channel after the event. I will also add links in the chat to sign up for our newsletter and our social media channels uh, to hear more about research and events at CID. And this is the last speaker series event of the semester. Uh, we'll be starting back up again in a couple of months, but we wanted to thank you for your continued engagement uh, and presence in these seminars. But without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Kate Rayworth. Kate Rayworth is an economist focused on making economics fit for the 21st century. Her book, Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, is an international bestseller and has been translated into 20 languages. Uh, this was also long listed for the 2017 Financial Times and McKinsey Business Book of the Year Award. She is the co-founder of the Donut Economics Action Lab, working with cities, businesses, communities, governments, and educators to turn donut economics from a radical idea into transformation. She teaches at Oxford University's Environmental Change Institute and is professor of practice at Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. So thank you all for being here. Um, and Kate, I will pass it over to you. Thank you, real pleasure to be here today and to join everybody uh, for the end of this series. Let's send it off with donuts. So I'm going to share my screen so I can show you some donuts in action. Um, and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give a quick overview of donut economics and then talk what, what happens when we bring it down to the level of a city and actually start putting it into action. But I'm going to start with my big critique of 20th century economics that I was a student in the 1990s here in the city of Oxford, where I now live again, um, studying economics and just desperately frustrated by the worldview that it conveys in the core images and concepts at its heart. So 20th century economics. The starting point, it's the same the world over, it's supply and demand, which from day one says, welcome to economics, here is the market, as if the economy was predominantly the market and that we put price at the center of our vision, meaning that anything that falls outside of a price contract is called an externality. And we find ourselves in the absurd uh, situation of calling the death of the living world an environmental externality, which to my mind alone raises enough alarm bells that this, this framing is not fit for our times. The self-portrait of humanity as we know is rational economic man. I decided to draw him. He'd look a bit like that. A man standing alone with money in his hand, ego in his heart, a calculator in his head and nature at his feet. And the real damaging aspect of this character is not just how narrow he is, it's what he does to us. Researchers such as Robert Frank have found that the more that students learn about rational economic man, they, the more they come to say they value traits like self-interest and competition over altruism and collaboration. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. The models are performative. And then the goal of economics. It's so deeply written, it's never drawn. It never arrives on the page, but it sits behind every economic textbook and indeed politician speech. And it's the goal of endless GDP growth. The situation that a country I mean, many of you may be sitting now in the US, I'm in the UK, we're sitting in two of the richest countries that have ever existed in the history of the planet. And yet our governments believe that the, the success of our countries depends upon yet more growth. And there has to be something absurd at some point that we have every country in the world believes it needs yet more growth to solve its problems. So I believe that these economic worldviews are part of the story of the 21st century challenges that we face, the crises that have begun from financial meltdown in 2008 to an era of COVID and climate, to an era of climate and ecological breakdown to a year of COVID lockdown. These show us how deeply interconnected we are with each other and the rest of the living world, that they fall, these crises hit with sharp inequalities of gender and race, of wealth and power from global North and global South. 
and that I believe they arise from the very systems we've created, systems that are built on the presumption of endless expansion. If you have a financial system that ex expects to expand endlessly, you're probably going to kick off a subprime mortgage market. If you have an energy and industrial system that assumes to endlessly extract Earth's fossil and mineral resources, we will induce climate and ecological breakdown. And if we have a system of human settlements that are endlessly encroaching on wildlife areas, coupled with ever rising flights between countries, we create perfect conditions for a global health pandemic. So I believe we need to transform the shape of progress. It is not endless expansion and never ending growth. For this, I offer a donut, the only one that turns out to be good for us. The goal is to leave no one falling short on the essentials of life in the middle of the donut, where they cannot meet their food, health, education, housing, equality, political voice, essential needs. I say this because I've crowdsourced them from the world's government. They are, of course, the 12 social dimensions of the Sustainable Development Goals. The power of that being that it means every government in the world has already agreed that every person in the world has a claim to meeting these essentials. Leave no one in the hole. We've all agreed to that. But at the same time, we cannot overshoot the ecological ceiling because that's where we use Earth's materials in such a way that we put so much pressure on the life supporting systems of planet Earth, we start to kick them out of balance. We cause climate breakdown. We acidify the oceans. We create a hole in the ozone layer. We create a breakdown in the web of life and ecosystems. And these nine dimensions are known as the planetary boundaries, first created just over a decade ago by Earth system scientists like Johan Rockström, Will Steffen, and others. They say these are the life supporting systems that make this delicately balanced, unique living planet in the universe such a hospitable planet for humanity. So put those two together, and the goal of the donut is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And the shape of progress has already been transformed. It's not endless expansion. It's thriving, dynamic thriving in balance. And that changes everything. It's actually a shape of progress we already know in our bodies. We know that health lies in balance. And if we can take it from bodily health to planetary health, we're gonna give ourselves the best starting point metaphorically that we could hope for. If that's where we want to be, it's very far from where we are. All of the red here shows the extent to which humanity is falling short. The little red wedge on food, for example, goes 11% of the way to the middle of the circle because 11% of people don't have enough food to eat worldwide. You can see there's human deprivation on every one of those dimensions, the majority of it in low income countries, but we can all walk out into the cities where we live and see deprivation in the midst of plenty. So while there's significant enduring human deprivation, we have collectively already overshot multiple planetary boundaries. So I see this as humanity's collective selfie. This is the image that I believe tells us it's our generational challenge to turn around, to, for the first time in human history, to start meeting the needs of all while already coming back within the means of the living planet. And let's remember that last century's economic theories and government policies and business models were not designed to solve for this. So we'd be crazy to think that they were going to do it. We have to come up with theories and policies and business models of our own for our own times in recognition of this challenge that we face, because we're the first generation to see this challenge. And once you've seen it, you can't forget it. I sincerely believe that your children and your grandchildren and mine will judge us for what we did once that we saw and knew this challenge. So what are we going to do? I'm showing you the global story. This is all of humanity and the whole planet, but most policymaking happens closer to home. So let's bring it down to a national level. Researchers at Leeds University did a fantastic downscaling of the donut with available international comparable data for 150 countries. I really recommend you go to their website if you want to look up your own. So we've got Malawi on generating around $1,000 per person per year. You can see a lot of human deprivation, that red in the center, but at the national level on a per person, per person basis, Malawi is not overshooting its pressure on the planet. China in the middle, both falling short on human success and overshooting planetary boundaries, like many countries, on around $17,000 per person per year. And Australia, one of the countries actually, I, I used to work at the United Nations Development Program on the Human Development Index. And sometimes it was my job to go on the radio of the country that come up number one. It was always Australia or Norway or Canada. And the reason they're number one is because they have a nearly blue circle in the middle. Well done, long lives, high incomes, 
good education, good health outcomes. But the HDI completely misses that massive red overshoot. And high income countries like Australia, Norway and Canada actually have the biggest overshoot. So let me be clear, this is not about ecological emissions and pressures only within the land that is known as Australia. This is Australia's consumption footprint. It's all the carbon and water and fertilizer and land and materials embedded in everything that's imported into Australia to be consumed, the food and clothing, electronics, consumer goods, construction materials. Australia on around $55,000 per person per year. That's their challenge. Let's now put this in a framework. This is around 100 countries. The three I've just shown are in red. The goal is to be in that top left-hand corner to meet the needs of all people, but to do so within the means of the planet. The first thing we see, there is not a single country that can say we're there. So in my mind, it means we should never ever talk about developed countries. I mean, I've never been to a country that can call itself developed. Yeah, we're a developed, we're an advanced nation, a developed nation, where? I can't see any. They all are on journeys of transformation. Low income nations have an unprecedented task to meet the needs of all of their people without overshooting planetary boundaries in the way that every nation before them has done. How will they do this? It's never been done before. No nation can say we're developed, follow us. Middle income countries have to meet people's needs for the first time while already coming back within those planetary boundaries. And many of these countries are currently making massive long-term lock-in infrastructural investments in transport, in housing, in energy systems, in water systems. How will they do that? And will it allow them to pivot towards the donor? And then the high income countries, which like to call themselves developed, but clearly are not, have equally an unprecedented journey to make to, to meet the needs of all their people for the first time, because they certainly have the means to do so but massively to come back within planetary boundaries on a journey that's never been done before. This is unprecedented. So to me, this tells us we need unprecedented ambition and humility within every country. And though these dots stand apart on the page, we of course know these nations, histories and futures are deeply interconnected by histories of colonialism, military power, ongoing trade and finance rules, resource extraction, and the present and future impacts of climate change with a dynamic from the global north to the global south. So we need transformation within countries and between all, moving in the direction of the donut. Let me bring it down another level because I said oh, today I would talk about cities. So let's think of one city, Amsterdam. Could, city, could Amsterdam live in the donut? And while I talk about this particular city, I invite you to think of a city that you know, whether you're living in it now, where you were born, where you plan to live, where you have lived, just take your mind to a city and ask yourself, what would it mean to apply this framework there? So let's unroll the donut and make a space and ask ourselves, what is the vision of the future we want, both in our city, but also in our city's relationship to the rest of the world? And we can use this to open up and imagine. And I'm using Amsterdam because it was the first city to adopt the donut officially as a guide for its policymaking this time last year, April 2020, in the height of its COVID infection. So. Here's the question we invite every city to ask themselves. How can your city, Amsterdam, become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? And that breaks us down into four lenses inside the donut. Let's start with the local social lens. So how can all the people of Amsterdam thrive? Let's first think of who are all of the people of Amsterdam, their diverse histories, cultures, their backgrounds, ages, nationalities, identities. How can all of those people thrive? How can everyone be healthy and enabled and connected and empowered so that they meet all of those social foundations inside the donut? Only the people of Amsterdam can answer what it means there to thrive. That is a local conversation. Add to that the question of how can Amsterdam thrive in its natural habitat? Every city and town and village is you know, located in a unique spot on the surface of planet Earth, nestled in a very specific ecosystem. It might be at the top of a mountain, on a plateau, in a valley, in a desert, in tropical areas, in a grassland, in a dryland. And nature has a genius for thriving in all of these places differently. She's evolved to sequester carbon and generate renewable energy and house wildlife and recycle water and form soil and cool the air. How can the city begin to aim to match or exceed the generosity of the wildland next door, the ecosystem in which it's embedded. 
So these two lenses I've introduced are the local aspirations, thriving people in the thriving place. And that's what many cities actually stop at. It's a great place. It's the most livable city in the world. That's only half the story because we know that every city is deeply interconnected with people and planet worldwide. So we have to match that local aspiration with global responsibility and add, how can Amsterdam respect the health of the whole planet? Thinking of all the food and consumer goods, electronics and clothing and construction materials imported into the city. You saw that red overshoot on Australia. The Netherlands has a big overshoot too. How can that city come back within its impact on planetary boundaries, massively reducing its carbon footprint, but also its material footprint, land use, water use, un unprecedented transformation. And then ask through those same supply chains, how can the city ensure that it's respecting the rights of people worldwide? We know that global supply chains, if you follow them to the end, you will find exploitation. How can cities say that actually we're doing everything we are able to ensure that we respect the rights of the people worldwide in the way we live here. So those are the four lenses of the city portrait and we've been using it at multiple scales with different cities. Here's examples from workshops we did before anybody had heard of COVID-19 in late 2019 in Portland, in Philadelphia and Amsterdam. These are city policymakers and some community members sitting around the four lenses of their city's donut, looking at the interconnections. And what we really found in these workshops was that people, first of all, uh, appreciated that whatever they worked on, whether it was education or sewage or equality or housing, it was present, it was visible in that portrait, but also they could lean across and look at the interconnections with others and step out of their silos of specialism and see the whole. We've got a lot of feedback around that. People wanted to make holistic policy. So what would you do? I mean, where would we start economics again if we could start and, and give ourselves a chance of making this holistic kind of policy? For me, I would never start economics with supply and demand. I start here with what I call the embedded economy diagram. We recognize that the economy is embedded in society. It is a social construct. It's just an invented set of relations that we can reinvent. And society, human society embedded in the rest of the living world. We're drawing in materials, we're putting out waste. We're bathed in a river of solar energy that makes it all possible. But dive inside the economy itself. Yes, okay, there's the market where we show up as rational economic man, the theory tells us, where you may be consumer or producer, you're shopping or working or shopping or working. And in the realm of producer, are you labor getting a wage or capital getting the return? Economic starts there and adds the state where the market might fail. Well, the state might need to step in. In relation to the state, you may be a public servant, a resident and a user of public goods, a voter protest to all crucial roles that we play in relation to the state. 20th century economics obsessed with the ideological boxing match between these two. Are you for free market less fair capitalism or state loving socialism? And in that boxing match, and this is what shows up as GDP, of course, in that completely missed two other fundamental sources of our well-being, the household, where we all begin every day, except oftentimes when you're a student and you're extracted from the household and you're living in halls. It's ironic that at the moment we most need to be aware of it, studying economics, we are plucked from it. You may be parent, partner, relative or child, the cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping that goes into raising children, doing it all again tomorrow. That's what makes labor fresh and ready to work every day. But also the commons, made famous by Ellen Ostrom, Many people say, what is the comment? It's a place where people come together, not through the market, not through the state, but as a community, where people follow a shared set of rules of production and harvesting and, and stewardship of resources, volunteering, sharing, co-creating, repairing goods and services that we value, often without money changing hands. It could be a neighborhood garden on the corner of your block. It could be Wikipedia on the World Wide Web. So we weave these identities together seamlessly every day, each one of us. If you just think about it, you, you are moving between these identities, but we rarely name them. And we need to create economies and city economies that enable us to thrive in all of them because life works well when they all have the space to thrive. What we've learned, I think one thing from COVID is that when market spaces are literally forced shut due to the need for physical distancing, the state has to step in and we suddenly realize and ask ourselves whose work is essential work and who is at the front line of that essential work. The household takes on unprecedented pressure. People find either joy or extreme stress in being literally locked in the household. 
And then the commons can step in, whether it's a food bank or a neighborhood WhatsApp group, that sense of looking out for each other. And, and we hear in surveys around the world, people say the one thing we don't want to lose as we come out of lockdown is that sense of a we. We are not merely rational economic man. We are social adaptable humans who reciprocate. And this is what makes a society work and our economies work. So adding to that, how do we get into the donut? If all the red here shows us the extent of degradation of the living planet, but also extremes of inequality between human beings. We need to transform the dynamics of our economies globally, nationally, and at the city scale. We need to create regenerative and distributive economies. Let me explain. Degenerative, we have inherited in degenerative industrial systems where we take us materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while and throw it away. And this is what it looks like when we take again and again from Earth's sources. And when we throw a waste again and again into earth sinks, the plastics in lakes and rivers and electronics in the neighborhoods of the world's poorest people. I sincerely believe your children and mine will pull pictures like this from the archive and tap us on the shoulder and say, did you know about this? Did you, did you ever see this? Because they will see it for what it is, which is shockingly disgusting the disrespect and disregard for our impact on the living world and other people. We have to turn and bend those linear degenerative arrows around to create a regenerative circular or cyclical economy in which resources aren't used up, they're used again and again, far more carefully, collectively, slowly and creatively. And here you can see that we separate biological nutrients, organic materials that nature builds and breaks down and rebuilds, that is nature's way. We then take technical materials, human-made materials that won't decompose and we need to mimic nature by restoring, repairing, reusing, refurbishing and recycling. This is an economy in which waste from one process becomes food for the next. It runs on renewable energy, it's going to be modular by design so you can take something apart and replace just that thing that needs replacing and we shift from ownership to service, whether it's cars or washing machines or light bulbs. A few examples from around the world of regenerative design and practice. In districts of Nairobi, one of the places where there were no toilets, there now are toilets thanks to an enterprise called Sanergy that uh, set up by uh, former students from MIT actually, who set up uh, Sanergy micro enterprises throughout the neighborhood. The waste is collected every day and it's turned back into fertilizer. Now at the level of the circular economy, this is nutrient flow being closed, the loop is being closed, but at the level of society, this is health, this is dignity and enterprise. In Lome and Togo, brilliant uh, people in a place called Wolab started dragging out the dumped linear degenerative uh, electronic waste that was being dumped in their city, extracting the parts and started actually assembling computers and building 3D printers. And the first thing you can do with a 3D printer is print another one, showing that actually they were using the end chain of the linear degenerative economy to start making their own circular loops. In the city of Medellin in Colombia, this river used to be seen as a very handy industrial sewer, just taking away all the toxins. And then when they think about how do we belong to place, how can this city be part of the ecosystems in which we're embedded? The river is of course the lifeblood of the city. So transforming that river and opening up parks around it to make it a place that brings people, giving people access to green space and to connecting with nature and each other. And then in Amsterdam, the city I began with, they committed to being 100% circular by 2050, 50% circular by 2030, 10% circularity in all government contracts by next year. And there's a district of the city that's been set aside for experimental circular design. But also along with being regenerative, we need to have cities that are distributive. We've inherited divisive cities and economies that gather opportunity and value in few hands, and they need to be shared far more equitably with all who co-create it. So let me show some examples of that. In this city of Curitiba in Brazil, very well-known example of a city that many decades ago in the 70s put in dedicated highways for buses. And you can see that little tunnel is the bus stop. So that to get the, if you're traveling, commuting into, this, into the city center from, from an hour outside, you're gonna take the bus. It's fastest, it's cheapest, it's affordable, it's clean. This makes sense. This is public luxury. They are now of course moving these to electric buses. In uh, Chile, the brilliant architect Alejandro Aravena realized that many people would never be able to afford to buy a house just out of their reach. They would always be trapped in the rental market. 
And so he realized they could afford half a house. So we started literally building half houses with all the electricity and the water and the plumbing that you need. You buy your half house. And then years later, as you save up, you can fill the rest in. And by changing the design of an architecture of a house, he opened up ownership to a huge group of people who otherwise would always have been trapped in that rental market. So distributive ownership of wealth of housing. In Bangladesh, I know this isn't a city, but I particularly like this example from a village in Bangladesh. You think you're looking just across rooftops, but if you look a little bit carefully, there are solar panels everywhere. And these have been connected in a microgrid. So the houses have the ability to generate their own electricity, to choose to buy or sell to their neighbors through an enterprise called SolShare that is looking to create microgrids like this so that you have distributed ownership of the power to generate electricity. And then the last example I show in Bogota, turning places like car parks, why would you give all that prime city space over to car parking? Make it a human park, a place where neighborhoods can actually meet. People say, I meet people like myself, I meet people not like myself. And it's places like this that make me say, I actually like where I live, I choose to be part of this community. So those are just some illustrations of distributive design. You can think of many, many more. What really matters though, is not the layout of the streets, it's the design of the institutions of a city. Talking with many mayors and city administrative staff, I've heard so many say, you know, we've just for decades actually been focused on serving growth. And the question we've always been asked is how can we make our city grow? And what's our city GDP? And actually now we're asking, how can we make our city thrive? And what is it that enables cities to pivot between these two? What, what are the differences that are happening that you can meet a, a city still stuck on growth and others focused on thriving? Five design traits, and I'll give a few examples of each. So purpose, what is the purpose of the city? Is the, is the mayor talking about growth and competition or are they talking about thriving and collaboration? Amsterdam now has a vision to be a thriving, inclusive, regenerative city for all residents while respecting planetary boundaries. That's transformative, but it has to be backed up by other designs too. So networks using the power of procurement. Amsterdam is using its procurement power to, circ to procure circular materials. University hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio, realized that the hospital was right on the edge of a neighborhood that had a low income neighborhood and almost nobody from that neighborhood worked there. So they decided to use their power of hiring to create a distributive job opportunity, to hire people from that neighborhood, to give them training in applying for the jobs, to enable mothers to come back after maternity leave, to enable people who had one conviction and deserved a second chance to come back. And they've expanded the opportunities in that neighborhood through a very intentional scheme. And then collective procurement, the C40 network of cities brings big cities together. They collectively went to bus making companies and said, we want to buy a lot of electric buses from you. And because of the size of the order and the economy of scale, the bus company says, okay, we can actually make those five years faster than otherwise if you'd come separately. So the power of procurement to bring the future further towards the present. Governance, I mentioned Amsterdam, they have set really ambitious regulations. There will be no fossil fuel vehicles in the city from 2030, and no fossil fuel boats in the canals and on circularity too. They're learning through experiment. I mentioned the experimental zone that they've set up. So let's try everything here. And that experimental zone will inform the city. And of course the city will then inform the country and it'll inform the European Union. And then they're creating new metrics because if they've got a goal of being circular, how will you know? You need to create the metrics that actually enable you to measure that. Let's go deeper to ownership. Who owns the sources of wealth creation in the city? Who owns the land and housing? In some cities, it's incredibly concentrated in few hands. In the city of Vienna, which is shown here, 60% of people live in housing that's owned by the city or city-owned cooperatives, 60%. So it's normal to live in affordable, socially owned housing. That opens up accessibility of the city in ways you can all imagine. Who owns the utilities? Who's receiving the income that's generated by the city residents buying water and electricity? Who owns the data, which we know is a massively valuable asset? And who owns the businesses doing business in the city? Is it multinational companies that are actually paying tax somewhere else or nowhere? Or is it local enterprises that are part of the web of this local economy? And lastly, finance, of course, crucially, it's at the bottom because it underpins everything. How does the city get its revenue? So many cities depend upon car parking charges. What if they take cars out of the city center as part of cutting carbon emissions? Where will it come from then? The city budget, 
a massive opportunity to rethink and reimagine the power of the budgeting cycle and what's included in that budget. And then city pensions, investing and divesting, a lot of course around the future of finance. So let me pull back. If we want to live in the donut, we can bring it down to a particular city and explore it through four lenses. We can recognize that we have multiple identities in the economy, which is embedded in the living world. We need to create regenerative and distributive economies in those cities. And what matters is the design of the institutions and the design of business itself. We worked with Amsterdam to launch Amsterdam's city portrait in April, 2020, a year ago. We found the power of peer-to-peer -peer inspiration was huge. As soon as that came out, and it was no longer us at Donut Economics Action Lab talking about the idea of it, but the city of Amsterdam saying, well, we're doing this. Within weeks, other cities began to follow. So we quickly published the methodology because our, our, our philosophy is to make everything that we do open access. We published our methodology and within months, there were cities and nations around the world picking it up and running with it. From Devon, the Donut Collective, making their own and adapting it to their own context to just this week, the city of Melbourne and Australia have launched their Melbourne donut with an amazingly impressive array of over 40 institutions and 600 people involved in, in imagining what would it look like for Melbourne to live in the donut. They're popping up everywhere. And what we love is the variety of them. It's taking that core concept and adapting it to where you are. Amsterdam was the first city to have a local movement spring up. So not only the city government, but local people said, we're gonna make the Amsterdam Donut Coalition. And again, peer-to-peer -peer inspiration. Suddenly they were popping up everywhere in Australia and Malaysia and Barbados and Berlin and Ireland. And then the people running these networks started getting together. And this is all self-organizing. So we are fascinated to see the power of self-organizing and the momentum that it's generating. The portrait methodology that we developed, as you know, I talked about Amsterdam and Portland and Philadelphia, we began with cities of the global north because we believe this is where the responsibility lies to move first and fastest. But we've had a lot of interest from cities and places and nations in the global south as well. So we are currently running a ongoing series of workshops with people who approached us and say, well, let's design this together. Let's figure out what it will take to adapt this methodology, which originally designed from a perspective of the global north. How does it adapt to a global south context, especially where there may be no data? How do we make it relevant here? So if these ideas are interesting, there's a lot going on in Donut Economics Action Lab. We invite anybody to join, to check out the materials that have been created. There are tools there and ideas and stories of how different people are putting it into practice because it's this peer-to-peer -peer inspiration that makes it fly. So I'll stop there and really look forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Kate. Um, I'll pass it over to Shada, who will moderate the Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you so much, Professor Rayworth. It's an honor to have you with us here today. That was a wonderful overview of the concept, but also how it's evolving uh, on the ground in, in many countries in the world. So that's really heartwarming to see. Um, so just to get us started on some questions while uh, everyone thinks in the, the, uh, the beautiful information, um, I had a question for you, Professor, on sort of the level of applicability of the donut. At one point, we heard that the EU was thinking of applying it. Uh, you showed us how the analysis by Leeds University has been looking at it at a country level, and you've shown us examples on the city level. Can you speak a little bit in terms of what is the most effective level uh, for us to think about applying the donut, or can we think of it on many different levels? Thank you. Great question. I think the most effective level is whatever is most effective in that place. Um, it's actually the first question that came up when we began working with the researchers and, and um, from the Global South, the network I just showed. One of the first things they said, well, hang on, um, Barbados. They said, well, we're doing it at the level of Barbados as a nation. We want to do that level. Others are doing it at the neighborhood level of a town or a city. Should we do it within the city walls or do we do the city region? And our response is, it's going to vary. It can make sense on many levels. So if, you, if, if you're familiar with Ellen Ostrom's concept of polycentric governance, we need governance on so many levels. People need to govern how they use a shared village well. And we need the United Nations and the, and the world's the, the climate change negotiations at the global level. And we need the regions and the nations and the districts and the provinces. So it can work at many levels. But 
some of the criteria I'd say to take into account is where is the jurisdictional power? If, it, if, we, if we're looking to actually transform jurisdictional power, introduce the kind of legislation that Amsterdam has done around circularity, you might want to work at the scale where you've got that power. Or does it make sense to work at the same scale of a bioregion, a whole island, a watershed? Or does it make sense to work uh, across two or three cities that have a strong cultural connection and are looking to create a circular economy between them? So I think there's no single answer. As you said, it could work at many scales. We are learning this just by seeing what it is that people choose to do. So I should just add that we have never once asked, begged, requested, lobbied, even encouraged anybody to use the donut. Everything that's happening around the world is because change makers in that place have said that looks like it's useful for what we want to do. So it's freely available. There are principles that you need to follow, but it's freely available for anyone to use and adapt. And so we're seeing what's happening. And so the levels at which it's being used are the levels at which people are choosing and finding it's most effective. And it, we're just getting the whole scale from a neighborhood to a nation. And indeed the last workshop I went to in 5th of March, 2020, just as lockdown happened, was in the European Union and there were people working inside the European Commission who were really keen to make it a core concept there. So we're just watching and seeing how that evolves. Thanks, Professor. We have a question from uh, Desir in the chat and he says, could you please provide more information on the new metrics derived from the donut monitoring that's currently happening? Uh, on the, the ones, uh, particularly around Amsterdam, I'm guessing. So Amsterdam yeah. are asking themselves, so that's particularly around monitoring circularity. It's a really interesting question, right? If you think of a circular economy as an economy in which resources are used more slowly, more carefully, more collectively, they're used again and again. How do you measure that? How do you measure circularity? So one thing you can do is, at the scale of a city, is to say, mm -hmm. Um, how do we, of the total material flow in our city, how is it changing between newly sourced materials and reused materials or bio-based materials? So that's the first point. But they're looking, and, and they're only just beginning to, to try and figure this out. They're looking for what mm -hmm. are the best data points um, to be pursuing. And in fact, on our platform, there's a great um, talk by Juan Carlos Goyo, who's the chief data chief data geek of the city of Amsterdam. He's brilliant. And he's done a presentation called From the Donut to Data Monitor in Amsterdam, if you're really interested. And he dives and explains how he's designing that system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Shashank has his hand raised. Shashank, please go ahead with your question. Thank you, Shada. And <clears throat> thank you, Professor Robert. It's an absolute honor to, to hear about the very inspiring work you're doing. My question is about the incentive. So you, you said that entities, it is, if it is a city, a company, or a country, they need to not just think about within their own boundaries, but they also need to think about the impact they're having on the outer world. Mm. My question is, how do you create incentives so that they're encouraged to do so? Within their own boundaries, the incentives are clear. If you're a company, you're managing your risks. If you're a country, you're managing your revenues, you're managing your profits. But when it comes to beyond your own boundaries, what are the incentives uh, that exist for them to act? That's a great question. Um, even let's just talk about, what do you want? Do you want to talk about cities or businesses? Uh, businesses maybe okay let's just so one of the chief advantages of lockdown is you end up with everything on a cardboard stick so here we are here's that signboard that i was talking about um and every time i work with companies and we've done a lot of work with companies that have again said oh we're interested in the donut and what does this mean for us and we say we can talk about the design of your product but ultimately we want to talk about the design of your enterprise right so what is your purpose dear company why do you exist what are you in service of how do you network your suppliers your customers your obvious relationships with your community how are you impacting on the world through how you buy and sell how do you govern yourselves who has voice in your decision making what are the metrics by which you judge your success and report your success and by the way what are the incentives you pay your middle managers and are they aligned because they're very you know ceo speaks to great purpose middle managers are, are you know paid to maximize next quarter's profits but now let's come down to the really important stuff of companies how are you owned how is this company owned? Because whether it's owned by its employees or shareholders or venture capital or the state or founding entrepreneur, it's going to have a huge impact on how that company is financed and what that finance expects and demands, where it comes from and how profits are distributed. So this is, I, I use this whenever I encounter any company, I use these five design traits, which I got from the corporate analyst, Marjorie Kelly. 
Uh, I use these five design traits to be like a detective about what that company can be and do in the world. Now, to your point, a company can shape and, and, and it has control over these five things. Um, it's hard to control your ownership and finance once you're set up. If you are a shareholder owned company in the stock market, it's pretty hard to move that and it has huge ramifications, but you have control over your network's purpose and governance. Your question is what, what I think, what, you know, beyond the company, I mean, the regulatory environment within which it's doing business, how can we, I think we need to reshape that too. So we can't just say to a company, you need to become regenerative and distributive by design because they might say, well, I mean, I've spent time talking to um, chief financial officers of some very big corporations who say, look, we really want to be sustainable. We really want to source ethically, but every quarter, I have to report that we have growing sales, growing market share, growing revenue, because that's what the quarterly report, that's the demands of the, that's because the way we're owned and the way we're financed, we're trapped. So we need to see more systemic regulatory changes, of course, in finance, in reporting, in um, disclosure, to say, to, so that the regulatory environment in which business sits actually starts pushing it towards this design, rather than saying a company alone can do it because they can't. I, I know that doesn't go all the way into your answer, but I hope that starts to touch just as just as a city has its locality and then beyond any enterprise, of course, sits in and uh, is nested in regulation, national and regional and global. And it means that no one level can make all the changes it wants to make. So a town can do some changes, but we're stuck with national government or stuck with regional EU legislation, just as a company can aim to be more regenerative, but unless the regulatory framework around it changes, it can only go so far. For me, the point of this is you've got to start somewhere. You've got to build up the people who are starting to put pressure on the governments, the business, the progressive business that creates that alliance and lobby to pressure, make our best practice standard practice so we can go even further ahead. Thank you, Professor. By the way, can I ask you, please, everybody call me Kate, because I really, I actually just feel like I'm Kate and I'm having a chat with some fantastic people. So everybody call me Kate. That would make me feel very at home. That's something I always forget. So Kate, <laughs> Shaheen has a question for you. Shaheen, please Kate. unmute and go ahead. Hi, Kate. Um, I'm really excited to be talking with you. I was like so excited when I saw your name on the series. Um, so I've been diving into your concept about donut economics um, like quite a bit this week. And um, in one of your talks, you mentioned that boundaries create environments conducive to creativity. Mm. Um, the question that I would like to ask is, what are some of the constraints experienced or conditions specific to small island nations such as Barbados with regards to thinking through the implementation of the donut? Because I'm talking to you from Mauritius and I apologize for not putting my camera on. It's just that we had torrential rains and I don't have mm. lights at the moment. Um, and uh, also my second question um, is, what are some of the outcomes from the workshops for adapting the donut for countries of the global south? And is there any way to participate in those? Thank Great you. questions. And thanks for joining from Mauritius, um, especially in the conditions you're clearly overcoming <laughs> the boundaries of connection and, and finding creative ways to join us. So, yeah, I, I really so boundaries unleash creativity. Let me say let me tell you why I say that, because when I, I worked at Oxfam in when I was working at Oxfam and I first drew this donut and I um, more, more cardboard pop-ups. Um, when I first drew this, it was a discussion paper in Oxfam and it went around that Oxfam has offices in many, many countries. And it was particularly actually my colleagues in the US being very candid, my colleagues in the US said, ah, do we really need this? Like, what is this thing, you know? Um, and some of them said, you know, we Americans, when we see a boundary, we want to shoot right through it. So that doesn't really work for us. And, and that's just, tells you a lot about kind of frontier mentality and um, colonization of spaces. But I thought, really? So you're telling me that when you see a boundary, you want to shoot right through it. So I, I said to this colleague, I said, so, so you're holding a baby, a one-year-old baby in your arms, and this baby has a temperature of 40 degrees. Are you going to say, go for it, girl, you burst through that boundary? No way. You are going to do everything you can to bring that child's temperature back down because you know that a high temperature is a risk to her life and you're gonna bring her back to health. We deeply know at the level of our bodies that boundaries are what signify health. Eat enough food, but not too much. Oh dear, I'm overweight, I'm underweight. I'm, you know, I'm too hot, I'm too cold. It's boundaries that constantly tell us rebalance and that's what keeps us alive. 
and I'm really seeing it now. I mean, in, in the in the talk you may have seen, Shaheen, I, I was saying, you know, Jimi Hendrix played on a six string guitar and Mozart had a yeah. five octave piano. He didn't say, I need 10 octaves. He just got on with it and did phenomenal music. And Naomi Osaka plays tennis on a within tram lines and it's the tram lines that makes tennis. Otherwise it would just be whackable. So it's boundaries that tell us this is the space now get creative. And I'm seeing that in Amsterdam. So Amsterdam has brought in these boundaries. They've said, we're gonna be hundred percent circular by 2050, too far away. We're gonna be 50% circular by 2030, meaning that 50% of the materials on in use in our city by 2050, 2030, in less than a decade, are going to be reused and bio-based. And next year, 10% of all the materials in our government contracts are going to be circular. Now those are boundaries. And somebody could look at that, oh, that's horrible red tape and regulation. And someone else would say, that is a really long legal loud message to the businesses of this city. If you want to stick in the city, you're really welcome to stick around. You just got to get circular or you've got to leave. It gives them super clarity about what's happening. And then now architects and designers and urban planners are already designing for this. And students coming out of the university, they've studied material science, they've studied architecture and design. And these students are saying, you mean I actually get to use these skills? I don't have to put them away in my pocket and go and work for a same old, same old company that doesn't want to do this. So I can absolutely see those boundaries are unleashing that creativity. I don't yet know what that means for Barbados. And to your second point, we've just started this process and we are going through five workshops and then we're going to open it up and invite everybody to participate. And we would absolutely love you to jump in and comment on what we've started putting together. So if you follow, if you go to Down Economics Action Lab or if you join our newsletter, you will get an email saying, hey, methodology is ready. We'd love everybody to jump in and help us make it as rich as possible. Bring Thank us you so much, Kate. Room. You're welcome. Um, so Isha gets to ask one quick question, uh, although I know we can all uh, spend much more time on this, but we're almost at time. So Isha, please, one quick question for Kate. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, my question, I'm entering my last year of undergrad and I've experienced the same frustration you mentioned um, in my first few years of studying economics with mm -hmm. The disconnect between what I'm learning and what I'm seeing in the world mm -hmm. um, and my question is how can we update like existing fundamental economic theory and kind of teach the next generation of economists to think differently and in a way that will actually help us <laughs> solve some of these problems oh it's the big one so I wrote Do Donut Economics when I was writing that book I had in mind the students I was like I'm going to write the book I wish I could have read when I was a student when I was thinking, oh, this, I, there must be something you know wrong with me. I don't quite get economics. I don't quite get why it does this. And what the book that would tell you, no, 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 it's not you. No, no, it's the theory. It's missing things. It doesn't get reality. And you're right. You're right to feel uncomfortable. Bring in the ecological and feminist and heterodox and complexity and diversity. And let's see what happens when we put all those ideas to dance on the same page. So I wrote it for that. I, I, as I said, uh, we've never, as, as Donut Economics Action Lab, we've never pushed or encouraged anybody to um, use the donut. In fact, very quick story. Um, my publisher said, oh, I can get you a seminar at the London School of Economics when your book comes out. And he sent the book to his contacts at the LSE and got this message back saying, well, thank you very much. We've passed it around, but we're not really very interested in this now. And I just thought, to be completely honest, I thought, well, that is the last time I'm letting that happen. I am not going to knock on the door of the establishment and let them say, sorry, sorry, not interested. So I thought, right, never going, never doing that again. So I've never once ever asked anybody. And so all the invitations and the requests have come, have been spontaneous and they've come through, guess what? Development studies, um, even development economics, business schools, business schools, because business happens in the real world. Businesses have supply chains and there are droughts and there are uh, strikes and they know that they need to connect with the world architecture schools, all sorts of different departments. So the, and I've had loads of contact with universities. The department that I've had least contact with over time is just economics. And in my mind, I've thought, fine, if you want to just sit there and not engage, that's okay, because there's so much going on over here, I'm gonna put my energy there. I was a mother of two very small children at the time. So I thought, I have no time to knock on shut doors. Still, your question is really important, Isha. So we have to transform economics. One, there's a brilliant student movement you know, may know about called Rethinking Economics, which sprung up after the financial crisis and the students realized they didn't understand diddly squat about how finance and banking work because they're not taught it. So they rebelled and said, 
we need to rewrite economics for this. Two, I would say if you want to enrich your economic spectrum, there's a great website called Exploring Economics, and it just shows you all these different schools of thought. And you're like, whoa, there's all these different ways of thinking of things. So that's a starting point. I don't know what the solution on the mainstream, because I have I'm, I'm doing this from outside of the establishment, outside the institutions, but I do know there are brilliant teachers everywhere who desperately want to teach this. In fact, after one one talk I gave at once in um, in Austria, a young professor, assistant professor came up to me and he said, you know, I really like these ideas. They're really exciting. I would love to be teaching this, but I'm on track for getting tenure um, and, and it's it's too risky. And I thought it's the institutions and the old expectations and, and the downside of peer to peer lock in. So many of you are currently within institutions and may have far better ideas than me about how to start making this happen. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Kate. And thank you for everyone joining. Really, Kate, your energy is and the work that you're doing is truly so inspiring. And you can tell the chat is kind of blowing up with folks wanting to share donut economics with you know, their local governments and other other folks. So oh, please do. Um, yeah, we've gone, we've gone a little bit over time, but um, I think it's been a really interesting discussion and, and folks have been so engaged. So thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, as we've said, this is the last speaker series event of the semester. Um, but uh, as you've signed up for this event, you'll be on the CID newsletter. So you'll be hearing about uh, future events like this and other research coming from CID. Uh, so uh, please don't hesitate to reach out and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thanks so much. Right. Thank you again, Kate. Bye. Bye everyone.